Hi everyone. So we're now into the next session after a great talk from Kiara. So um, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Kareem Habashi, uh, who's a postdoc at, at Bristol, um, and he's going to talk about his, his fascinating work on adapting to time, why nature evolved a diverse set of neurons. So Kareem, please do take it away. Um, 15 minutes and we'll have five minutes for uh, questions at the end. Okay, thanks then for the introduction and thanks everyone for attending my talk. I will try to convince you that uh, nature knows what it's doing. So uh, as I start, I'll, I'll talk about some motivation. So basically, uh, neurons are morphologically diverse and this di diversity is underrepresented in modeling. And uh, when I talk about morphological diversity, I don't only talk about the geometrical structure of the neuron, but also its electrical pro properties like the distribution of ion channels and uh, so on. Another underrepresented feature in general in, in, in ANNs is um, is bike timing. I mean, this conference, of course, it's, it's relevant, but outside like this conference or other conferences, ANNs really don't uh, take bike timing into account. And I'm really showing an example of the um, vibrotactical frequency perception, which is uh, best modeled by by uh, a burst gap code, not as bike rate code or a burst rate code. So I a temporal code is best describes this kind of uh, sense. So how to combine this into a, a single model? So we aggregate or condemn this, this kind of uh, underrepresentation of phenomena in a spiking model, which incorporates not only weights, but time coincidence and delays. So time coincidence is a surrogate for the dendritic structure, the ion channels and new modulators, and delays is a surrogate for the axonal structure and the dendritic structure. So th these are like a very rough aggregation of certain morphologies of neurons. And what, what type of model I'm using? I'm using uh, a simple model where the somatic potential is, is the sum or aggregation of a separate dendritic potential. And each dendritic potential takes into account the time constant delays. So as you say, as you can see from the equations, equation one, I'm showing the dendritic potential, which is uh, as you it's a normal um, you see in the, the integrated fire model, uh, and you have here the parameters of the time constant and delays con contributing to the potential. And in two, I'm showing that the uh, somatic voltage is a sum of these potentials. And of course, we have in three the um, spiking model. And in this work, we have a little bit of a twist. We added an extra parameter, uh, which is a spiking of the potential. What it does is that it makes the neuron spike more than once after a threshold crossing. So it's a surrogate for a, a bursting behavior. So, and what type of uh, models or, uh, or problems we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve binary logic problems. So like XOR, XNOR, ON and NAND. And in these problems, we're using um, a network a simple network of two inputs, one output, and four to six hidden units. And in this kind of network, uh, and our problems, we are using a little bit of a twist. The input is actually not spatially coded, but temporally coded. For example, yes, you have three spikes, and for the no, you have two spikes, and we vary this spike count or spike sequence. And the output can be one of two things. It can be the spike count, which is uh, known as the spike rate, and it can like take values up to four and three for yes and no in the in the binary problem, or it can be um, a spike a sequence of spikes, so a spike output. So when you have a spike input and a spike output, we say it's a special timber mapping. And then I will go to our first results. First, I have to say that we don't backpropagate our network, so we don't learn by backpropagation. We 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 uh, we evolve our network, so we use evolution to to to. Uh, learn the waste and points and delays. And when I say we evolve, I, we we mentioned that we don't learn, but we adapt the parameters. So when I mention adaption, I mean like uh, learning the parameters to solve a problem. And when we wanted to test the performance of this uh, evolved problems, we thought of the number of generations needed to find the solution. So, it, it, and this metric, is a surrogate for the easiness to find a solution. So if a solution is hard to find in, in searching, so it's not as favorable as a solution which is very easy to find. And on the left, I start with uh, weight based only solutions where only adopt weights. And I'm doing that for all logic problems, yeah, six logic problems on the Y axis and for different parameter input output combinations on the x axis so i go I go from simple uh, small spiking in input and output to larger spikes in the input and output 
And as you can see here, weights by themselves uh, cannot solve all the problems and in, not in all conditions. And then you, you start adding an, an, another temporal parameter, which is time constants, and you can see a little bit of uh, increase in performance. I will describe later why this might be uh, the case. And surprisingly, when you actually adopt uh, delays and time constants alone at one millivolt of weights, you can solve all logic problems. And it seems it can solve it really fast. Weights and delays can also solve it. And at, at this instance, we can, see, we can see that delays actually are more important than weights. When you try to solve these kinds of problems where we have a uh, temporal uh, um, favor in the inputs. And also finally, when also we can solve it, of course, when all parameters are adapted together. And why uh, weights and time constants can improve on weights only? There, there, there is uh, a hint for this, and I'm, I'm here showing a spiking raster plot for uh, example XNOR problem. And here I'm showing all the neurons on the y axis, like from uh, inputs one and two, three, four, and five, six are the hidden, and seven in the output. I'm showing the time on the x axis. And if we look at neuron number six, we see that the these synaptic neurons arrive at 16, but this is back at 17. Why this happens? This happens because of the interaction between slow excitation and fast inhibition. When this happens, this leads to a potential in, which is on the green, which is um, the green, which uh, rises until it reaches uh, surpasses the threshold. So this interaction between uh, slow excitation, fast inhibition can also like simulate delays. So this might be a hint why when weights and time constants work together, they can solve it a little bit better. And here I'm showing uh, an example spiking plot for uh, the case where delays and time constants can solve the XOR problem at fixed weights. I'm showing it now for a show off, but I'll, I'll, I'll come later. I'll come back later why this is the case. And um, one really one contribution to, to the performance of why delays and time constants can solve it, because maybe uh, weights and time constants share some functionality. So here I'm, I'm showing uh, the distribution of weights as you, you vary the output, uh, the number of spikes in the output. So if you fix the input input code and you start changing the number of spikes in the output, going from like zero to no, one to yes, to three, three spikes to no and four spikes to yes, we see that to shift the distribution of weights to more positive values. We need we need more positive values to get more spikes in the output, and and also this happens with time constants. So if if you want more spikes in the output, we need longer time constants, which kind of seems intuitive. So now back to uh, how can delays and time constants can solve uh, logic problems? It's because of two things. First, uh, time constants can can share some function functionality with weights. So time constant can self-inhibit when they are short and they can couple distance spikes when they are long. So they ki kind of help help delays in uh, mapping uh, the problem. So basically what I think, it, 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 what happens as follows. So delays desynchronize, as you can see from the hidden, hidden neurons. So they desynchronize the input and then to re resynchronize it at the, at the output to really uh, map uh, the relevant features to really solve the problem. And time constants really help this by this ability that they can self-inhibit and uh, uh, nearby spikes and couple far away spikes. And also I'm, I'm gonna talk about uh, the impact of these problems when you are trying to uh, avoid noise. So when I talk about noise, about two forms of noise, uh, there's noise in the inputs and noise in the parameters like weights. So first, I'm going to talk about noise in the input. So I have here two formulas of, of noise in the input. On the axis, I'm showing uh, the uncertainty in the spike location, the temporal uh, temporal input. And this is uh, quantified by the Gaussian uh, standard deviation. And on the x-axis, I'm showing the spike insertion probability, where uh, you can insert a spike in the spike train with a certain probability. And I'm showing, again, the performance of different parameter combinations. And and also I'm, 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 I'm that the performance is is calculated by the loss within 100 generations. So if I stop 100 generations and then take the the minimum loss of this kind of solutions, and as you can see here, that it's the most important parameter that we found is that weights are important when you try to avoid the nascent input. So without weights, as you can see, the recent time, for instance, are not so good. 
but also although it's an important delays and time constant add a little bit of uh, performance to the to the different types of noise so if you talk about noise in the spike jitter it's better to adapt delays like you can be you can bear this if you go up and if you are talking about noise and the insertion probability you see that time points are a little, time points are a little bit better than delays when adapted those weights of course all three together have the combined effect of delays and time constants and also when you talk about noise in the weight so for example if you have a, a software model you want to implement on a new fork hardware and sometimes there is error in the application and then you get noise in the weights so how to, like this kind of noise uh, in the hardware noise is not favorable and leads to like um, bad performance so how to avoid noise in the weights when you have these temporal parameters we see that if you like again we are using the loss as a performance metric if you train temporal parameters co-adapted co with weights you get a boost in the noise robustness so for example the best ones uh, is when weights and time points are together we see that it it really um goes beyond uh, weights or weights delays alone and th this this is important because uh when when you have hardware implementations of of models uh you can have a drift in the weight values and of course with aging you also have a drift in the weight values finally i'm i'm going a step up so before i was talking only on with a spike as a, the, the output code as spike count or spike rate but now i'm using as Spike uh, um, as back sequence at the output. So now the problem gets really hard. So before the problems was solved within like 10, gener 10 generations, but now as you can see uh, the uh, the generations can go up to like 150. So it gets it gets harder to solve the problem. And like weights, and I, I will start with only weights and time constants. So weights and time constants cannot actually uh, solve much. Um, yeah, the recent time constants also, uh, unfortunately, cannot solve much, but they increase a little bit the performance. Weights and, and delays huh, boost it a little bit, but once you adapt all three together, weights, the recent time constants, you get the first big jump in performance. And you get another big jump when you actually add uh, the boosting parameter. So there's two points here. First is that uh, temporal parameters are needed to really map special timber patterns efficiently or effectively. And also like having the right model, like incorporating this uh, boosting parameter really helps it a lot. And finally, as a caveat, I'm, I'm just showing that uh, you can control the output, uh, that you can control the delays distribution. So here you find that uh, you have an output code that is a spike, a spike a the location of the spike, and if you move this spike location from left to right, control the delay distribution from like mostly negative to mostly positive. So the output, like the input output, they are like a boundary condition or they regularize the delays inside the network or any parameter inside the network. Yeah, so I'm basically done. I hope, uh, I think it's too fast. Okay, so basically, yeah. No, no, please summarize, summarize. I was gonna say it's perfect timing. <laughs> please finish. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, delays but not weights are necessary to solve the, the problems. Um, weights by themselves cannot solve them. Uh, weights and time constants can simulate delays. Uh, the recent time constants surprising can solve all problems for all input encodings. Weights and time constants can share some functionality, which 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 helps uh, delays in their mappings. Um, yeah, and weights are very important in avoiding noise in the inputs, uh, and this is enhanced by delays and time constants in, in certain instances. And adapting time constants with weights is, is, is important in avoiding noise in the weights or increase robustness of uh, hardware implementations of uh, spiking networks. And all temporal parameters are needed to, to succeed in mapping the special temporal patterns. Um, but also incorporating a boosting Brompton improves the performance. And finally, uh, the output codes acts, acts as a regularizer for the daily values uh, and can take. And to, before I go to the conclusions, I want to show just to, to make a few claims. First, I have to say that this work is done, it, it stresses the importance of time in feed forward networks. And when I, when I think about evolution, which is the title of this work, I always remember uh, the 
quote of the title by Paul Sisek that if you want to understand like uh, with, uh, intelligence, sometimes it's it's good to think of in the light of evolution, like think about evolution, what what it needs to do. So if, if we think that evolution is trying to uh, find the best model to ease the tertiary th base, then you have you see that if you are, if if a, a evolution came up with a model that has time like temporal parameters it in it then this model will succeed faster in finding solutions compared to models that have that has that doesn't have time so again we, i don't claim that we we solve evolution or we know how evolution does i'm just saying that if if evolution by chance came up with a model that uh, has temporal parameters this model will will find solutions faster than other models that doesn't uh, yeah, and temporal parameters are needed to map special temporal spike patterns, as you can see, in feed-forward networks. And also, they are um, important in avoiding noise in both the inputs and the weights. And yeah, and outlook, I mean, there's a lot of things to be done here. Uh, yeah, I think a, a very interesting thing to do is compare to recurrent networks. I, I got this uh, comment from the reviewers, by the way. <laughs> and rising time constant, so I'm also using decay like time, time constant with uh, time constant rising time constants is, is very interesting. And yeah, and some linear interactions. Yeah, and thank you for your attendance. And I hope um, I'm ready to answer your questions. I hope. Yeah. Thanks, th thanks Kareem. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, really wonderful uh, stuff. So um, I'll get right into it because we'll have a, a few minutes for a couple questions. And I think you've actually answered some of the questions already because I can, I, I can tell. So um, the first question here is from Julia. Um, why did you choose a specific input and output encodings and how might it influence the solution? Could it be that another encoding might be easier to solve with the weights? So I, you, you tested these kind of maybe five or six different types of encodings and weights didn't do so well. So the question, yeah, is, is basically, is, is that biasing maybe? You know, it, it, could it be that another encoding would have been better with the weights? Um, good question. I actually cannot answer this fully because I didn't try. But maybe, I, I mean, I, I know that spiking networks, uh, like we can work well without weights. But here I'm, I'm, I'm using this kind of code because it like mimics a burst code. Because if I, if, if I go up, this kind of code, like in the input, uh, this kind of code here mm -hmm. is a precise symbol code, like a burst. If, if you like combine this, trains a lot, like a, lo a long chain, you have like a brass code. So I I'm not aware of how uh, weights would work with a brass code. So even even if um, weights can work with other codes, but then I would shift my talk and say, OK, but at least for this kind of code, weights don't work. So y y yes, I may, uh, there might be a bias here. But uh, at least for this case, I'm like, 90% 99% confident because also uh, like if 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 uh, if i say weights cannot find it i'm not 100% sure i mean like i'm i'm evolving 2 million solutions per generation here for weights and like it, it's about highly unlikely like i'm not saying no i'm just highly unlikely just to be uh, precise in my notation Great, and just really quick one before we have to finish the session uh, from Timothy, which was nice talk. Why not use backprop to learn the delays and the weights and the weights in brackets? So, so you've kind of talked about this a little bit with your evolutionary uh, uh, approach, but yeah, why not use backprop to learn the delays? Uh, well, it, it's it's not easy because uh, it's only until recently that people started using backprop uh, backprop with delays. Uh, but there's another another thing with evolution. Aside from that, it might be a little bit harder to um, like uh, learn three parameters together. Actually, four because I'm also having a processing parameter. But evolution actually gives you diverse solutions, so you actually have an array of different solutions for the same problem. Backpropagation usually can like have different solutions if you like try to initialize the 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 the, the weights or bias metrics differently. Try to to converge to different, different solutions, but evolution actually like just they come up with random a lot of random uh, different solutions to same problems. You can you have an idea of, about the distributions, what problems work, and what what to really affect their their behavior. Kareem, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Dan, and everybody. Yeah, everyone. Um, we're just going to start the next session now. Again, will be thirty probably thirty seconds, and you'll be ported in. It'll be teleported in.
So I'll see you in a moment.